I remember only that there was, on that evening, enough point in his behavior to make me, after he had fled, wonder audibly what he meant. To this, Hermann, crossing his legs with a swing and settling himself viciously away from me in his chair, said, That fellow don't know himself what he means. There might have been some insight in such a remark. I said nothing, and still averted, he added, When I was here last year, he was just the same. An eruption of tobacco smoke enveloped his head as if his temper had exploded like gunpowder. I had half a mind to ask him point blank whether he, at least, didn't know why Falk, a notoriously unsocial man, had taken a visiting a ship with such assiduity. After all, I reflected suddenly, it was a most remarkable thing. I wonder now what Hermann would have said. As it turned out, he didn't let me ask. Forgetting all about Falk, apparently, he started a monologue on his plans for the future. The selling of the ship, the going home, and falling into a reflective and calculating mood, he mumbled between regular jets of smoke about the expense. The necessity of dispersing passage money for all his tribes seemed to disturb him in a manner that was the more striking because otherwise he gave no signs of a miserly disposition. And yet he fussed over the prospect of that voyage home in a mailboat like a sedentary grocer who has made up his mind to see the world. He was racially thrifty, I suppose, and for him there must have been a great novelty in finding himself obliged to pay for traveling, for sea traveling, which was the normal state of life for the family, from the very cradle, for most of them. I could see he grudged prospectively every single shilling which must be spent so absurdly. It was rather funny. He would become doleful over it, and then, again, with a fretful sigh, he would suppose there was nothing for it now but to take three second-class tickets, and there were the four children to pay for besides. A lot of money, that, to spend at once. A big lot of money. I sat with him, listening, not for the first time, to these heart-searchings, till I grew thoroughly sleepy, and then I left him and turned in on board my ship. At daylight, I was awakened by a yelping of shrill voices, accompanied by a great commotion in the water, and the short, bullying blasts of a steam whistle. Falk, with his tug, had come for me. I began to dress. It was remarkable that the answering noise on board my ship, together with the patter of feet above my head, ceased suddenly. But I heard more remote, guttural cries, which seemed to express surprise and annoyance. Then the voice of my mate reached me howling expostulations to somebody at a distance. Other voices joined, apparently indignant. A chorus of something that sounded like abuse replied. Now and then the steam whistle screeched. Altogether, that unnecessary uproar was distracting. But down there in my cabin, I took it calmly. In another moment, I thought I should be going down that wretched river and in another week, at the most, I should be totally quit of the odious place and all the odious people in it. Greatly cheered by the idea, I seized the hairbrushes and, looking at myself in the glass, began to use them. Suddenly a hush fell upon the noise outside, and I heard, the ports of my cabin were thrown open, I heard a deep, calm voice, not on board my ship, however, hailing resolutely in English, but with a strong foreign twang, go ahead. There may be tides in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood, and so on. Personally, I am still on the lookout for that important turn. I am, however, afraid that most of us are fated to flounder forever in the dead water of a pool whose shores are arid indeed. But I know that there are often, in men's affairs, unexpectedly, even irrationally, illuminating moments when an otherwise insignificant sound, perhaps only some perfectly commonplace gesture, suffices to reveal to us all the unreason, all the fatuous unreason of our complacency. Go ahead are not 
particularly striking words, even when pronounced with a foreign accent, yet they petrified me in the very act of smiling at myself in the glass, and then refusing to believe my ears, but already boiling with indignation, I ran out of the cabin and up on the deck. It was incredibly true. It was perfectly true. I had no eyes for anything but the Diana. It was she, then, was being taken away. She was already out of her berth and shooting athwart the river. The way this lunatic plucked that ship out is a caution, said the odd voice of my mate close to my ear. Hey, hello, fuck, Hermon, what's this infernal trick, I yelled in a fury. Nobody heard me. Fox certainly could not hear me. His tug was turning at full speed away under the other bank. The wire hawser between her and the Diana stretched as taut as a harp string, vibrated alarmingly. The high black craft careened over to the awful strain. A loud crack came out of her, followed by the tearing and splintering of wood. There, said the odd voice in my ear, he's carried away their towing chalk. And then, with enthusiasm, Oh, look, look, sir, look, at them Dutchmen skipping out of the way on the forecastle. I hope to goodness he'll break a few of their shins before he's done with them. I yelled my vain protests. The rays of the rising sun, coursing level along the plain, warmed my back, but I was hot enough with rage. I could not have believed that a simple towing operation could suggest so plainly the idea of abduction, of rape. Falk was simply running off with the Diana. The white tug careered out into the middle of the river. The red floats of her paddle wheels, revolving with mad rapidity, tore up the whole reach into foam. The Diana in midstream waltzed round with as much grace as an old barn, and flew after her ravisher. Through the ragged fog of smoke, driving headlong upon the water, I had a glimpse of Fox square, motionless shoulders under a white hat as big as a cartwheel, of his red face, his yellow staring eyes, his great beard. Instead of keeping a lookout ahead, he was deliberately turning his back on the river to glare at his toe. The tall, heavy craft, never so used before in her life, seemed to have lost her senses. She took a wild sheer against her helm, and for a moment came straight at us, menacing and clumsy, like a runaway mountain. She piled up a streaming, hissing, boiling wave halfway up her blunt stem. My crew let out one great howl, and then we held our breaths. It was a near thing, but Falk had her. He had her in his clutch. I fancied I could hear the steel hawser ping as it surged across the Diana's forecastle, with the hands on board of her bolting away from it in all directions. It was a near thing. Hermann, with his hair rumpled and a snuffy flannel shirt and his pair of mustard-colored trousers, had rushed to help with the wheel. I saw his terrified round face. I saw his very teeth uncovered by a sort of ghastly fixed grin, and in a great leaping tumult of water between the two ships, the Diana whisked past so close that I could have flung a hairbrush at his head, for it seems I had kept them in my hands all the time. Meanwhile, Mrs. Hermann sat placidly on the skylight with a woolen shawl on her shoulders. The excellent woman, in response to my indignant gesticulations, fluttered a handkerchief, nodding and smiling in the kindest way imaginable. The boys, only half-dressed, were jumping about the poop in great glee, displaying their gaudy braces. And Lena, in a short scarlet petticoat with peaked elbows and thin bare arms, nursed the rag doll with devotion. The whole family passed before my sight as if dragged across a scene of unparalleled violence. The last I saw was Hermann's niece with the baby Hermann 
in her arms, standing apart from the others. Magnificent in her close-fitting print frock, she displayed something so commanding in the manifest perfection of her figure that the sun seemed to be rising for her alone. The flood of light brought out the opulence of her form and the vigor of her youth in a glorifying way. She went by perfectly motionless and as if lost in meditation. Only the hem of her skirt stirred in the draft. The sun rays broke on her sleek tawny hair. That bald-headed ruffian, Nicholas, was whacking her on the shoulder. I saw his tiny fat arm rise and fall in a workmanlike manner and then the four cottage windows of the Diana came into view, retreating swiftly down the river. The sashes were up, and one of the white calico curtains was fluttered straight out like a streamer above the agitated waters of the wake. To be thus tricked out of one's turn was an unheard-of occurrence. In my agent's office, where I went to complain at once, they protested with apologies they couldn't understand how the mistake arose. But Schomburg, when I dropped in later to get some tiffin, though surprised to see me, was perfectly ready with an explanation. I found him seated at the end of a long, narrow table facing his wife, a scraggy little woman with long ringlets and a blue tooth, who smiled abroad stupidly and looked frightened when you spoke to her. Between them, a waggling kunkka fanned twenty cane bottom chairs and two rows of shiny plates. Three Chinamen in white jackets loafed with napkins in their hands around that desolation. Schomburg's pet table, the Hoti, was not much of a success that day. He was feeding himself ferociously and seemed to overflow with bitterness. He began by ordering in a brutal voice the chops to be brought back for me. And turning in his chair, mistake, they told you, not a bit of it. Don't you believe it for a moment, Captain. Falk isn't a man to make mistakes unless on purpose. His firm conviction was that Falk had been trying all along to curry favor on the cheap with Herman. On the cheap, mind you. It doesn't cost him a cent to put that insult upon you. And Captain Herman gets in a day ahead of your ship. Time's money, eh? You are very friendly with Captain Herman, I believe, but a man is bound to be pleased at any little advantage he may get. Captain Herman is a good businessman, and there's no such thing as a friend in business, is there? He leaned forward and began to cast stealthy glances as usual. But Falk is, and always was, a miserable fellow. I would despise him. I muttered grumpily that I had no particular respect for Falk. I would despise him, he insisted, with an appearance of anxiety which would have amused me if I had not been fathoms deep in discontent. To a young man fairly conscientious and as well-meaning as only the young man can be, the current ill usage of life comes with a peculiar cruelty. Somber of mind and without appetite, I struggled with the chop while Mrs. Schomburg sat with her everlasting stupid grin and Schomburg's talk gathered away like, like a slide of rubbish. Let me tell you, it's all about that girl. I don't know what Captain Herman expects, but if he asked me, I could tell him something about Falk. He's a miserable fellow. That man is a perfect slave. That's what I call him, a slave. Last year I started this table d'hote and sent cards out, you know. You think he had one meal in the house? Give the thing a trial, not once. He has got hold now of a Madras cook, a blamed fraud that I hunted out of my cookhouse with a rattan. He was not fit to cook for white men. No, not for the white men's dogs either. But see, any damn native that can boil a pot of rice is good enough for Mr. Falk. Rice and a little fish he buys for a few cents from the fishing boats outside is what he lives on. You would hardly credit it, eh? A white man, too. 
He wiped his lips, using the napkin with indignation, and looking at me. He flashed through my mind in the midst of my depression that if all the meat in the town was like these table d'hote chops, Falk wasn't so far wrong. I was on the point of saying this, but Schomburg's stare was intimidating. He's a vegetarian, perhaps, I murmured instead. He's a miser, a miserable miser, affirmed the hotel keeper with great force. The meat here is not so good as at home, of course, and dear too. But look at me. I only charge a dollar for the tiffin, and one dollar and fifty cents for the dinner. Show me anything cheaper. Why am I doing it? There's little profit in this game. Falk wouldn't look at it. I'd do it for the sake of a lot of young white fellows here that hadn't a place where they could get a decent meal and eat it decently in good company. There's first-rate company always at my table. The convinced way he surveyed the empty chairs made me feel as if I had intruded upon a tiffin of ghostly presences. A white man should eat like a white man, dash it all, he burst out impetuously. Ought to eat meat. Must eat meat. I manage to get meat for my patrons all the year round, don't I? I'm not catering for a damn lot of coolies. Have another chop, Captain. No? You, boy, take away. He threw himself back and waited grimly for the curry. The half-closed jalousies darkened the room pervaded by the smell of fresh whitewash, a swarm of flies buzzed and settled in turn, and poor Mrs. Schomburg's smile seemed to express the quintessence of all the imbecility that had ever spoken, had ever breathed, had ever been fed on infamous buffalo meat within these bare walls. Schomburg did not open his lips till he was ready to thrust therein a spoonful of greasy rice. He rolled his eyes ridiculously before he swallowed the hot stuff, and only then broke out afresh. It is the most degrading thing. They take the dish up to the wheelhouse for him with a cover on it, and he shuts both the doors before he begins to eat. Fact. Must be ashamed of himself. Ask the engineer. He can't do without an engineer, don't you see? And as no respectable man can be expected to put up with such a table, he allows them $15 a month extra mess money. I assure you it is so. You just ask Mr. Ferdinand La da Costa. That's the engineer he has now. You may have seen him about my place. A delicate, dark young man with very fine eyes and a little mustache. He arrived here a year ago from Calcutta. Between you and me, I guess the money lenders there must have been after him. He rushes here for a meal every chance he can get. For just please tell me what satisfaction is that for a well-educated young man to feed all alone in his cabin like a wild beast. That's what Falk expects his engineers to put up with for fifteen dollars extra. And the rows on board every time a little smell of cooking gets about the deck. You wouldn't believe. The other day da Costa got the cook to fry a steak for him. A turtle steak, it was, too. Not beef at all. And the fat caught or something. Young da Costa himself is telling me of it here in this room. Mr. Schomburg, says he, if I had let a cylinder cover blow off through the skylight by my negligence, Captain Falk couldn't have been more savage. He frightened the cook so that he won't put anything on the fire for me now. Poor da Costa had tears in his eyes. Only try to put yourself in his place, Captain. A sensitive, gentlemanly young fellow. Is he expected to eat his food raw? But that's your falk all over. Ask anyone you like. And Schomburg tapped his manly breast. I sat half stunned by his irrelevant babble. Suddenly he gripped my forearm in an impressive and cautious manner, as if to lead me into a very cavern of confidence. It's nothing but enviousness, he said in a lower tone voice, which had a stimulating effect upon my wearied hearing. 
I don't suppose there is one person in this town that he isn't envious of. I tell you he's dangerous. Even I myself am now safe from him. I know for certain he tried to poison. Oh, come now, I cried, revolted. But I know for certain. The people themselves came and told me of it. He went about saying everywhere I was a worse pest to this town than the cholera. He had been talking against me ever since I opened this hotel, and he poisoned Captain Hermann's mind, too. Last time the Diana was loading here, Captain Hermann used to come in every day for a drink or a cigar. This time he hasn't been here twice in a week. How do you account for that? He squeezed my arm till he extorted from me some sort of mumble. He makes ten times the money I do. I have another hotel to fight against, and there is no other tug on the river. I am not in his way, am I? He wouldn't be fit to run an hotel if he tried, but that's just his nature. He can't bear to think I am making a living. I only hope it makes him properly wretched. He's like that in everything. He would like to keep a decent table well enough, but no, for the sake of a few cents, can't do it. It's too much for him. That's what I call being a slave to it. But he's mean enough to kick up a row when his nose gets tickled a bit. See that? That just paints him. Miserly and envious. You can't account for it any other way, can you? I have been studying him these three years. He was anxious I should assent to his theory. And indeed, on thinking it over, it would have been plausible enough if there hadn't been always the essential falseness of irresponsibility in Schomburg's chatter. However, I was not disposed to investigate the psychology of Falk. I was engaged just then in eating despondently a piece of stale Dutch cheese, being too much crushed to care what I swallowed myself, let alone bothering my head about Falk's ideas of gastronomy. I could expect from their study no clue to his conduct in matters of business, which seemed to me totally unrestrained by morality or even by a commonest sort of decency. How insignificant and contemptible I must appear for the fellow to dare to treat me like this, I reflected suddenly, writhing in silent agony, and I consigned Falk and all his peculiarities to the devil with so much mental fervor as to forget Schomburg's existence, till he grabbed my arm urgently. Well, you may think and think till every hair of your head falls off, Captain, but you can't explain it in any other way. For the sake of peace and quiet, I admitted hurriedly that I couldn't, persuaded that now he would leave off, but the only result was to make his moist face shine with pride of cunning. He removed his hand for a moment to scare a black mass of flies off the sugar basin and caught hold of my arm again. To be sure, in the same way, everybody is where he would like to get married. Only he can't. Let me quote you an instance. Well, two years ago, a Miss Vanlow, a very ladylike girl, came from home to keep house for her brother Fred who had an engineering shop for some repairs by the waterside. Suddenly Falk takes to going up to their bungalow after dinner and sitting for hours in the veranda saying nothing. The poor girl couldn't tell for the life of her what to do with such a man, so she would keep on playing the piano and singing to him evening after evening till she was ready to drop. And it wasn't as if she had been a strong young woman either. She was thirty, and the climate had been playing the deuce of her. Then, don't you know, Fred had to sit up with them for propriety, and during whole weeks on end never got a single chance to get to bed before midnight. That was not pleasant for a tired man, was it? And besides, Fred had worries then because his shop didn't pay, and he was dropping money fast. He just longed to get away from here and try his luck somewhere else. But for the sake of his sister, he hung on and on till he ran himself into debt over his ears. I can tell you, I myself could show a handful of chits for meals and drinks in my drawer. I could never find out, though, where he found all the money at last. 
can't be, but he must have got something out of that brother of his, a coal merchant in Port Said. Anyhow, he paid everybody before he left, but the girl nearly broke her heart. Disappointment, of course, and at her age, don't you know? Mrs. Schomburg here was very friendly with her, and she could tell you, awful despair, fainting fits. It was a scandal, a notorious scandal, to that extent that old Mr. Seegers, not your present charterer, but Mr. Seegers, the father, the old gentleman who retired from business on a fortune and got buried at sea going home, he had to interview Falk in his private office. He was a man who could speak like a Dutch uncle, and besides, Mrs. Seeger had been helping Falk with a good bit of money from the start. In fact, you may say they made him as far as that goes. It so happens that just at the time he turned up here, their firm was chartering a lot of sailing ships every year, and it suited their business that there should be good towing facilities on the river. See? Well, there's always an ear at the keyhole, isn't there? In fact, he lowered his tone confidentially. In this case, a good friend of mine, a man who can see here any evening, only they conversed rather low. Anyhow, my friends, certain that Falk was trying to make all sorts of excuses, and old Mr. Seegers was coughing a lot, and yet Falk wanted all the time to be married, too. Why? It's notorious that a man has been longing for years to make a home for himself, only he can't face the expense. When it comes to putting his hand in his pocket, it chokes him off. That's the truth, and no other. And I've always said so, and everybody agrees with me by this time. What do you think of that, eh? He appealed confidently to my indignation, but having a mind to annoy him, I remarked that it seemed to me very pitiful, if true. He bounced in his chair as if I had run a pin into him. I don't know what he might have said, only at that moment we heard through the half-open door of the billiard room the footsteps of two men entering from the veranda, a murmur of two voices at the sharp tapping of a coin on a table. Mrs. Schumberg half rose irresolutely. Sit still, he hissed at her, and then, in an hospitable, jovial tone, contrasting amazingly with the angry glance that made his wife sink in her chair, he cried very loud, Tiffin, still going on in here, gentlemen? There was no answer, but the voices dropped suddenly. The head Chinaman went out. We heard the clink of ice and the glasses, pouring sounds, the shuffling of feet, the scraping of chairs. Schomburg, after wondering in a low mutter who the devil could be there at this time of day, got up napkin in hand to peep through the doorway cautiously. He retreated rapidly on tiptoe and, whispering behind his hand, informed me that it was Falk, Falk himself, who was in there. And what's more, he had Captain Hermann with him. The return of the tug from the outer roads was unexpected but possible. For Falk had taken away the Diana at half past five, and it was now two o'clock. Schomburg wished me to observe that neither of these men would spend a dollar on a tiffin, which they must have wanted. But by the time I was ready to leave the dining room, Falk had gone. I heard the last of his big boots on the planks of the veranda. Hermann was sitting quite alone in the large wooden room with the two lifeless billiard tables shrouded in striped covers, mopping his face diligently. He wore his best go-ashore clothes, a stiff collar, black coat, large white waistcoat, gray trousers, white cotton sunshade with a cane handle reposed between his legs. His side whiskers were neatly brushed. His chin had been freshly shaved, and he only distantly resembled the disheveled and terrified man in a snuffy nightshirt and ignoble old trousers I had seen in the morning hanging on the wheel of the Diana. He gave a start at my entrance and addressed me at once in some confusion, but with genuine eagerness. He was anxious to make it clear he had nothing to do with what he called the tam business of the morning. It was most inconvenient. He had reckoned upon another day up in town to settle his bills and sign certain papers. 
There were also some few stores to come, and sundry pieces of my ironwork, as he called it quaintly, landed for repairs, and had been left behind. Now he would have to hire a native boat to take all this out of the ship. It would cost five or six dollars, perhaps. He had had no warning from Falk, nothing. He hit the table with his dumpy fist, der verflucht curl, Tam Roper, making a great noise, and took him away. His mate was not prepared. His ship was moored fast, he protested, but it was shameful to come upon a man in that way. Shameful. Yet such was the power Falk had on the river that when I suggested in a chilling tone that he might have simply refused to have his ship moved, Herman was quite startled at the idea. I never realized so well before that this is an age of steam. The exclusive possession of a marine boiler had given Falk the whip hand of Ossol. Herman, recovering, put it to me appealingly, but I knew very well how unsafe it was to contradict that fellow. At this I only smiled distantly. The curl, he cried. He was sorry he had not refused. He was, indeed, the damage, the damage. What for all that damage? There was no occasion for damage. Did I know how much damage he had done? It gave me a certain satisfaction to tell him that I had heard his old wagon of a ship crack fore and aft as she went by. He passed close enough to me, I added significantly. He threw both his hands up to heaven at the recollection. One of them grasped by the middle the white parasol, and it resembled curiously a caricature of a shopkeeping citizen in one of his own German comic papers. Ach, that was dangerous, he cried. I was amused, but directly he added with an appearance of simplicity, the sight of your iron ship would have been crushed and like, like this matchbox. Would it, I growled, much less amused now, but by the time I had decided that this remark was not meant for a dig at me, he had worked himself into a high state of resentfulness against Falk. The inconvenience, the damage, the expense, Gott for them, double take the fellow. Behind the bar, Schomburg, with a cigar in his teeth, pretending to be writing with a pencil on a large sheet of paper, and as Hermann's excitement increased, it made me comfortingly aware of my own calmness and superiority. But it occurred to me, while I listened to his revelings, that after all the good man had come up in the tug. There, perhaps, since he must come to town, he had no option. But evidently he had had a drink with Falk, either accepted or offered. How was that? So I checked him by saying loftily that I hoped he would make Falk pay for every penny of the damage. That's it, that's it, go for him, called Schomburg from the bar, flinging his pencil down and rubbing his hands. We ignored his noise. But Hermann's excitement suddenly went off the boil as when you remove a saucepan from the fire. I urged on his consideration that he had done now with Falk and the confounded tug. He, Hermann, would not, perhaps, turn up again in this part of the world for years to come, since he was going to sell the Diana at the end of this very trip. Go home, passenger, in a mail boat, he murmured mechanically. He was therefore safe from a fox malice. All he had to do was race off to his kind signees and stop payment of the towage bill before Falk had the time to get in and lift the money. Nothing could have been less in the spirit of my advice than the thoughtful way in which he set about to make his parasol stay prop against the edge of the table. While I watched his concentrated efforts with astonishment, he threw at me one or two perplexed, half-shy glances. Then he sat down. That's all very well, he said reflectively. It cannot be doubted that the man had been thrown off balance by being hauled out of the harbor against his wish. His stolidity had been profoundly stirred, else he would never have made up his mind to ask me unexpectedly whether I had not remarked that Falk had been casting eyes upon his niece. No more than myself, I answered with literal truth. The girl was of the sort one necessarily casts eyes at, in a sense, 
She made no noise, but she filled most satisfactorily a good bit of space. But you, Captain, are not the same kind of man, observed Hermon. I was not, I am happy to say, in a position to deny this. What about the lady? I cannot help asking. At this, he gazed for a time into my face, earnestly, and made as if to change the subject. I heard him beginning to mutter something unexpected about his children growing old enough to require schooling. He would have to leave them ashore with their grandmother when he took up that new command he expected to get in Germany. This constant harping on his domestic arrangements was funny. I suppose it must have been like the prospect of a complete alteration in his life, an epic. He was going to to part with the Diana. He had served in her for years. He had inherited her from an uncle, if I remember rightly, and the future loomed big before him, occupying his thought exclusively with all its aspects as on the eve of a venturesome enterprise. He sat there frowning and biting his lip, and suddenly he began to fume and fret. I discovered to my momentary amusement that he seemed to imagine I could, should, or ought have caused Falk in some way to pronounce himself. Such a hope was incomprehensible, but funny. Then the contact with all this foolishness irritated me. I said crossly that I had seen no symptoms, but if there were any, since he, Hermann, was so sure, then it was still worse. What pleasure Falk found in humbugging people in just that way I couldn't say. It was, however, my solemn duty to warn him. It had lately, I said, come to my knowledge that there was a man, not a very long time ago, who had been taken in just like this. All this passed in undertones, and at this point Schomburg, exasperated at our secrecy, went out of the room, slamming the door with a crash that positively lifted us in our chairs. This or else what I had said, huff Hermann, he supposed, with a contemptuous toss of his head towards the door which trembled yet, that I had got hold of that man's silly tales. It looked, indeed, as though his mind had been thoroughly poisoned against Schomburg. His tales were, they were, he repeated, seeking for the word trash. They were trash, he reiterated, and moreover I was young yet. This horrid aspersion, I regret I am no longer exposed to that sort of insult, made me huffy too. I felt ready in my own mind to back up every assertion of Schomburg's on any subject. In a moment, devil only knows why, Hermann and I were looking at each other most inimically. He caught up his hat without more ado, and I gave myself the pleasure of calling after him. Take my advice and make Falk pay for breaking up your ship. You aren't likely to get anything else out of him.